with me today, I have Dr. Judy Beck from the Pacific Forestry Center, and we wanted to ask her a few questions about fuels in the forest. And the question we're going to start the conversation with is, in your experience, what are the most problematic aspects about how we have approached fuel measurements to date? Problems depend on what you're measuring fuels for. And so um, I, I think um, some of the problems are that uh, we might have started out with um, trying to figure out exactly what's driving safe fire behavior for a particular driving safe fire behavior for a particular forest type. Uh, and that would have led us to identify certain characteristics, typical overstory, understory, forest floor litter, lichen layer, shrubs and continuity. And, and just whatever your spread or fire intensity perspective would have led us down a path of what was appropriate to measure or what we might have seen as obvious elements to measure. And from there, we just sort of built on in a fairly ad hoc fashion, but based on kind of where we would have had problematic fire behavior or uh, suppression behavior or uh, suppression issues in, in the past in Canada's history, for example. Um, that, that kind of leads you to just sort of add on in a very ad hoc fashion in terms of uh, what you're characterizing and how you're characterizing things. Uh, clearly, the Americans took during and, and I'd say that was actually a positive thing because Canadians, the Canadian approach tend to be very pragmatic and things that our fire management practitioners could understand. So there's a positive in that. But um, academically, we can go down a rabbit hole and get into very complex constructs, like complex constructs, like surface to volume uh, ratios, or you could have, you know, measured things like patchiness and use something like PILO's, PILO's in, uh, index, which would have characterized our black spruce forest very well, but would have been meaningless in grasslands unless you were maybe working in hummock grasslands in Australia. The, though, have really been, we do not understand the vertical strata of our fuels very well, and we don't characterize them. We like to simplify them or ignore that they exist. And so all the way from the forest floor, up to the very tip of a canopy in a forest has to be characterized appropriately. Is it on the forest floor? How deep is that? Um, are there, is there a lichen component to that? We've tended to ignore the shrub layer and the continuity of that and its impacts. And while during the August side of fire season, that shrub layer may or may not matter all that much. It matters a great deal. And that shrub layer may or may not matter all that much. It matters a great deal to our boreal forest mixed wood um, uh, types. We do not uh, characterize uh, that very well in Chisholm fire in Alberta, for example. We've tended to focus in Canada on the spring dip, much bigger than a spring dip in the moisture content of our conifer foliage. It's about not having that shrub layer in the understory because the deciduous components all lost its leaves. And then on snowmelt, we have a fully cured forest floor layer if we had any kind of grasses or component there that becomes flammable. And then the leaf out on those shrubs or in the minor mixed wood component of a more common conifer dominated forest is not considered for its dampening effects on fire behavior. And so we could really be picking up on that fire behavior. And so we could really be picking up on that very effectively using a variety of remote sensing, satellite technologies, et cetera, and we don't capitalize on it. Instead, we try to get into all these complexities of forecasting based on uh, an area percent, when snow has left a given site, all of these things we can now do using remote sensing technologies. I, I would argue the other problem with that uh, in terms of really understanding those, those strata is way back when, a long, long time ago, um, Western Australia started using something and it was really quite cool. It was a vertical stick that had markings on it at say half meter intervals. And if any kind of shrub or um, um, branch touched that stick, you would mark it as a, and then you could take a look at 
sort of the contact and relate that to uh, the volume in any given strata, if you like, the fuel arrangement within that, all the way from the forest floor to the tip of the canopy. Now we have LIDAR that could do the same kind of thing and we've never taken advantage of really understanding that full strata in Canada. So we, we capture it for the most so we, we capture it for the most part with things like height to base of the live crown. Um, but we could be doing so much more and we could use things like the old fashioned Levy stick to parameterize some of the new technologies we could get from in particular within plot or within stand LIDAR, like LIDAR, um, which I think is probably gonna be uh, most valuable. But why couldn't the next generation of our systems use within plot LIDAR, the same way we use weather station information. You know, if you were doing this sweep through seasonality, you could gauge the transition from snow melt, snow melt all the way to leaf flush. And then say, oh, we've really, we can downplay that spring wildland fire uh, condition. That having been said, I don't want us to lose sight with what we need are, um, you know, practical and measurable. Uh, that, that can of a culture forester who's trying to prescribe fuel treatments in the interest of community protection, or whether that's somebody who's wanting to plan prescribed fire for a site. I will say the only other thing that I think is really problematic from uh, Canada's approach to uh, fuel characteristics or fuel measurement is we fuel measurement is we, we are so focused on the FWI components and understanding kind of the interaction between the moisture measures and our fuel characteristics that we haven't really become more sophisticated about understanding what impacts moisture conditions of a given uh, fuel size or fuel type. And I'll give you some examples. You know, in the American system, they talk about one hour all the way through to thousand hour fuels. And that's simply about how rapidly they adjust to changing environmental conditions and change their moisture conditions. So you can think of, you know, the dead needle being and changing its moisture condition quite quickly, as opposed to, you know, a log on the forest floor. We should go straight to moisture content in and around some of these things. We, we, we've left it really simplistic, but we should actually refine that. And then we can talk about hourly, even minute by minute changes has become problematic as some realities of things we never thought about. So um, folks like Jeff Barry, who was a um, air attack officer and managed uh, aviation for BC for a very long time, uh, had said during the 2003 fire season that they really saw explosive. During the 2003 fire season that they really saw explosive conifer behavior, even in those super open pine types in British Columbia and couldn't quite figure it out, but they said something else is going on here. And the what was going on there is something that Brad Armitage and I figured out a while ago, but hey, if you wanna put your name to a public and have at it, because um, conifer uh, foliage moisture content is not only subject to spring, spring dip, it actually varies diurnally on a very hot, radiative, intense day. And we've never incorporated some of those things in our model. You just assumed that it didn't vary diurnally. Sophisticated technologies that we have at our disposal now, we should probably question some of what we thought wasn't really changing that much and have a closer look at it. Fantastic, thanks very much. That raises another question for me and I, I guess I'll, I'll stage it a little bit. It seems like we actually have, seems like we actually have quite a bit of understanding of things that could or almost certainly do influence fuels in the forest. And, and I guess the question I'd have is what are the most significant limitations of knowledge gaps when it comes to measuring fuels or, or characterizing the side of that question is what are the gaps or what are the problems to actually implementing some of those things we know? So. I guess I would say one of the biggest limitations we have is measuring some of these characteristics can be extremely tedious and time consuming and expensive. And so if you want time consuming and expensive. And so if you want to parameterize your LIDAR as a remote sensing technology, you still have to get in there and have sort of you know, concrete things uh, to convert that into like tons per hectare 
in terms of a fuel load, in terms of a fuel load, or surface area to volume ratios, uh, or or even you think about trying to actually come up with, you know, the uh, fuel load in a pile, a slash pile, um, as as sort of uh, harvesting residue. If you're actually going to find ways of doing these go no go gauge approaches to those things or modifying uh, those kind of techniques, you still got to go in and convert those measurements and actually physically measure tonnage. And that means you got to go into the pile and basically harvest the whole pile, put it in a truck, oven dry it, put it in a truck, oven dry it, then weight it, and then convert that to a tons per hectare uh, kind of construct. Likewise, moisture content is still very difficult to measure in reality. It's a very important parameter, but we measure on the basis of an oven dry, dry weight, the amount of, of, of moisture, i.e. water. Uh, and, and so you have to go sample that on an area basis in some way, shape or form, bring it back to the lab, um, oven dry it, and then take uh, the, the measurement differential between what it was before you put it in the oven and what it was after it came out and was dried and you did. Yeah, this is experience speaking. <laughs> um, and, and, and make all those calculations. And they're not easy things for the average practitioner to do. And um, there is also a heck of a lot of variability in these things in the field in reality. And so that's a little bit tricky. I'll, I'll highlight one other problem in reality. And so, that's a little bit tricky. I'll, I'll highlight one other problem uh, that's plagued us for a long time, and it's in relation to grassland curing. Visually, um, we have a bias around seeing green in the non-cured component of our grasslands versus very biased and overestimate if you just ask somebody to do that using some kind of an ocular measurement system. To get past that bias, Folks like Wendy Catchpool use the Levy rod approach again to try to put a, a formal methodology around that. All that being said, though, we only mainly measure curing because it leads us to an indication of the component of our grasslands that are varying in moisture content like a one hour fuel. That's the straw dead part which will be subject to minor changes in temperature and relative humidity, et cetera, versus the part that's green that is not subject to hourly change, right? And so really we're still trying to get at moisture content. Maybe we should look at sensors and see if we can't actually uh, use more sophisticated technologies to tell us what that moisture content is immediately and then pipe that into our, you know, our, our fire weather stations directly. Stations directly. Very, very interesting. Um, and speaking of interesting, what would you say is the most interesting thing that you learned during your career about fuels? Hmm. Oh, Brian, that's a hard one. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I don't know if you know, but at one stage in life, I was called the moisture mistress. <laughs> I wasn't only known for misbehaving, I was also the moisture mistress, but that's because of all the work I did in tediously measuring uh, hourly moisture content of forest floor, grasslands, um, bark uh, on uh, spruce, uh, pine types, uh, lichen. And I think one of the most important pieces that I learned about that is moisture content and, and actually fire, quite frankly, in those, those uh, particular strata. You don't really have fire until your moisture content. You don't really have fire until your moisture content's less than thirty percent. And so, like, you don't have to get in, get in tune with some academic exercise that's trying to define moisture content beyond that. You know, the wilting point, the point at which plants kind of die and will never recover in terms of not even if you give them lots is about seventy percent. You can see that in leaves that are kind of going yellow or have sort of uh, wrinkled to the point of no return. So you don't have to get really sophisticated about trying to understand moisture content across a huge regime. Your focus is sort of 2% to 30% and the rest just don't matter that much, that much. There's a couple of exceptions to that. One of the more interesting pieces is, you know, where you have a deep matted um, uh, forest floor or litter type or matted grass type. Um, those types are more subject to kind of the... Um, 
you know, indicators that would, would be the uh, DC or indicators that would, would be the uh, DC or DMC, well, BUI in totality in terms of moisture changes. Um, you know, you can have scenarios where in August, where you've had a lengthy drying period, you have a minor uh, sort of shower event that just dusts uh, things with a trace of rainfall. It means the top, those are really significant um, uh, things that we need to pick up on, which reminds me in the fall, our systems start to fail, especially if you're interested in prescribed fire, because we don't have dew incorporated within the uh, Canadian system. The Australians started to incorporate the impact of dew on those surface. Australians started to incorporate the impact of dew on those surface fuels. But if you're trying to prescribe buyers, you know, use prescribed fire in the fall on slash blocks or to do something more at a landscape level, then you actually need to pay attention to what's happening in those open cut blocks or more open grasslands that are sub oh, then within the forest itself, there can be a real difference. And so you may not have a dew in a, a denser forest, but you're gonna have big dew on perhaps the area you wanted to burn. And so, you know, you're, you're not gonna end up with the right results. What else have I learned? The Australians have done really cool things with this, uh, these levy rod things that perhaps we should look at in a bit more detail. And um, I'm an advocate for um, really moving off our indices and going straight to the actual moisture content which is within each of our forest types. I do not think that our FFMC correctly, think that our FFMC correctly reflects wetting and drying rates equally uh, or appropriately in all of our fuel types. So, you know, they, 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 it's not that sensitive to uh, the fact that, you know, um, grasslands have no canopy with an interception layer from up and different forest types have very different uh, interception capabilities for rainfall. And we could have the same FFMC, but really different things are happening uh, within those types. And so I'd love to see us go straight to moisture content, which is largely what the Australians have done. I think the only other piece that I, I would highlight for a variety of reasons, of course, woody debris, we measure for habitat for animals. Uh, and a variety of other things. We measure fuel characteristics for suppression difficulty, right? The physical organization of those uh, fuels. So slash, uh, windfall, um, and a variety of other slash, uh, windfall, um, and a variety of other things can impact suppression di difficulty along with other things like depth of burn tied to moisture content in some of those um, forest floor layers. So, so don't forget that because we're measuring for suppression difficulty, rate of spread, intense. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the Canadian uh, forest fire danger rating system really is primarily empirical. And what I'm hearing you say is there's probably an opportunity to be much stronger, stronger basis in, in the physical process. Is that correct? It is to a degree though. Is that correct? It is to a degree though. Um, it, it's, it's really hard to th throw the baby out with the bathwater, I suppose. The, the value of our um, system is that it's grounded in that, that real, real field fire database. And we may never get there. Like think about having the Canadian system so process-based or um, you know, going back all the way back to fundamentals to the point where you could use it for tropical fuel types and or Australia necessarily set the bar there. But um, if, if we could generalize some of these big things that I've spoken to, like, you know, have certain strata uh, categorizations or certain forest floor categorizations. For me, you gotta always start with what's under your feet. What is the forest floor made up of? What's under your feet? What is the forest floor made up of? Or what are you standing on, whether it's grassland or lichen? And then move up from there, move up and out. Yeah, that, a little more process based, but also really taking advantage of those new, the, the new technologies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think I, it's a good it, point. We, we have options now we didn't have years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, for, for me too, though, the practical and measurable and understandable from a practitioner's perspective. So the forester, the fire behavior specialist and the prescribed fire specialist still means we need to kind of, you know, 
measure with a, a ruler, mark it with chalk and cut it with a chainsaw. <laughs> And because you can get lost in the minutia with regards to measuring fuels, right? And as I've said, things are highly variable. Even if you looked out on a, on a paddock or a field that was pretty well planted <laughs> um, and we're trying to measure curing across that field, you would still find a lot of variability. Excellent. Leading to the next question we wanted to ask, which was what did you find the most puzzling or frustrating about fuels measurement and fuels characterization? Puzzling. So foliar moisture content, particularly in conifers, was a really hard nut to crack. Conifers was a really hard nut to crack. Like you think about it, right? You're trying, like the, the, you go back in the literature and it says, you know, you're, you're wanting to try to tackle the uh, tip of the um, shoots that are um, emerging in the spring and measure those quite different, quite differently. Uh, than last year or the previous year's foliage. And in theory, you should cover off, um, you know, from the bottom of the tree all the way to the top. Well, I don't know about you, but I never had a, um, a scissor lift on site. And um, it just doesn't allow you to sample at any intensity that would be scientifically, um, that would pass the scientific sniff test is how I'll put it. And, you know, following the tree to have to do that isn't really something we get to do this in this day and age readily. So that that can be problematic. I, you know, there were all kinds of hilarious um, old stories about, you know, hilarious um, old stories about, you know, the researchers having to go out and get their gun licenses so they could blow off the tips of branches. And, you know, when, when work was fun in the field, Brian. Um, so that was one. Uh, let's see. Oh my God, some of, um, and you went through the pain of some of the, um, both literature and also the mistakes that even researchers were making around, you know, surface area to volume calculations. You know, the, the, it was just epic. It's, and it goes back to the practicality of things, right? Um, I won't even go into the details here. I think into the details here. I think our um, go no go gauge, um, which was a lovely little, a handheld metal tool that allowed you to determine whether something fit in, i.e. would it go into um, a given um, uh, size hole on the gauge and they were cut on the gauge and they were cut in roughly, of course, this was all started back before we went metric, but it was, we, we turned it into metric. And this is for fuels that are uh, less than seven centimeters in diameter thickness. Um, so 0.5 centimeters uh, to 0.5 to one centimeter category. So they had, you had this little groove, some um, math that, well, you did the go, go, no, go gauge along a transect and anything that crosses the transect you would measure. And if you could think about this as really trying to quantify, quantify the fines all the way up to that seven centimeter diameter thickness thing, you're not measuring needles in this construct. Then you went through some complicated math. Then you went through some complicated math that um, no doubt could be far more sophisticated in this day and age, just mathematically. And you could use laser um, technologies for sure to do this. Uh, and we could modernize that. But one of the funniest things about that was there, there were errors in, there, there were errors in the first math publications tied to how you went about your calculations. And there were just, people would have these epiphany over and over again about how these errors uh, were in the original publications and they would get corrections and then addendums. Uh, one of those re recurred of loops that we couldn't get out of. So that was pretty funny. I think that's about it. That's and then maybe that leads to a nice, nice way to conclude this chat is what kind of advice would you give to fire researchers, fire students and practitioners yeah, so I guess my advice, yeah, so I guess my advice would still be, you know, try to be practical in, uh, in, in what you're measuring. Take notice of that, the variability before you launch into something in a big way. Because uh, if the variability is going to be too high, it's not going to be something that will yield good results on the dominant features. And, and you're going to find that out by actually talking to the practitioners and the prescribed fire specialists or the air attack officers to have them highlight for you within a given fuel 
complex that you're interested in, what they believe are really the dominating driving factor and driving factors around all three of those things, suppression, difficulty, rate of spread, um, actually four things, suppression, difficulty, rate of spread, fire intensity, and perhaps spotting distance or spotting capability, you know, where your source of um, firebrands really is going to come from. Well, thank you for with us today. Take care.